Hello, hello, and welcome to one of the most mixed reviews you'll ever see in your entire life. Uh, and that is Send and Ascends by Josiah Bancroft. Um, now, before Alan, I want you to calm down. I did enjoy the book. I just have sincere and massive problems with it. Before we get into it, if you do like, please do like and please do subscribe. And one thing to get out of the way, I came into this book with a lot of hype. I came into it being told that this, this was it for me. This was the fantasy book that would get my fucking rocks off. And so I came into it with, um, I tried to come up with with balanced expectations because I know people don't quite enjoy the fourth book. I wanted to um, measure my expectations. Uh, so I've been putting it off for a long time based on that fourth book. But when I was doing uh, Dear Doctor Fantasy with Philip Chase, he mentioned that uh, he was also going to be reading it. So we've done this kind of buddy read-ish thing together. We'll be having a discussion. Um, and so I've read it. The reason I was told I would love this is because it has very, what was described as literary fiction-y writing. Now I will say, this book has some of the most gorgeous writing in any fantasy book I've ever read. On a purely prose level, this is an astounding book with incredible description, fantastic world building, and I was absolutely absorbed by the writing style. Um, it really created a an atmosphere and the lyrical sense of the, the poetic sense of writing uh, was just gorgeous to read. It was a pleasure to read the book. However, our issues come in with part of the world. So to give you an idea, we are following Thomas Senlin, uh, this mild mannered headmaster who has come from this out of town place. And he's on his honeymoon with his uh, severely younger wife. Uh, going to the Tower of Babel, which is this massively talked about, this this monument to human development, uh, this this tower, that each tower is a different experience, it's this wonderful place to go, it is, it's like a, this foreign land that is ripe with adventure and, um, and like beauty and all of this jazz. I have confusion. I think confusion is the best way to put it. And it's confusion on what the author is trying to tell me. Um, and I know this is something that certain people definitely don't want to do. They don't want to think about the real world connotations. They just want to enjoy the book. They don't want to think about what the author's thinking. Distance from the author, I get that. Personally, I cannot do it. So, I'm going to lay out my issues. And people can address them in the comments if they want. Because I would love to hear other people's thoughts because uh, I have been, uh, it's fair to say, venting at Grace and uh, it's fair to say she's done with me. She's done with me talking about this book because she loves it and uh, I appreciate that she loves it and it's it, I don't want to bring her down. So I'm just, I'm not going to talk to her about it anymore. To give background, I read books out loud to my housemate when we just sat there. He'll be playing a game, I'll read the book out loud. It's just something we do. So, I was reading this and in my head I was starting to have this idea of, so it, it's Thomas Senlin, that they are both described as extremely white ass people and they're going to this exotic uh, Byzantine-esque place. Um, and so immediately, in terms of what the, the Tower of Babel is, this thing that is, it's uncomprehensible to the human mind, uh, like uh, how did humans build this, etc. I immediately thought of, they're going on a train, it's the idea of going to the Middle East or going to the Near East in, in, in real life. It's that idea of going to Egypt or India, etc. So, for instance, that you could relate to Tower of Babel to the pyramids. Um, that idea of how did humans create this? I cannot fathom it. Um, so that's the vibe I was getting. I was getting the vibe that in a real life connotation, this is what is essentially how my housemate described it. It's a colonizer going on his world tour. That's what it feels like. It's this era in time where the empire existed in the UK and uh, people were going to experience these new cultures that we hadn't seen before. The one key word I would use to describe this book is that it has a sense of 
cultural primitivism. The way that Thomas Semlin views the culture surrounding Babel before going there is that sense of this is a, a beautifully ripe new civilization that we are going to, I cannot wait to go there, I've always wanted to go and experience this culture, meet its people, be involved. So when that's subverted, and it's the idea that he turns up and all of the information he had is horribly inaccurate because it's told by people who have never been there and they're just trying to get a buck out of people. I loved that. I absolutely adored that idea. The idea, because each par each chapter starts with an epitaph from the Everyman's Guide to the Tower of Babel. And a lot of them have this humorous sense of giving information that is the antithesis of what actually happens to Thomas Sennin when he's there. So I was really enjoying that relationship. I was laughing at that. And I was like, oh, this is funny. But then, at the same time, the culture is fucked up. The culture does have that sense of, they, they set up the idea that this, this place is super sexual and uh, has this issue of subjecting women and minorities and, and poor people, etc. It's simultaneously critiquing you deserve to be able to go there and experience other people's cultures and maybe you don't understand it properly and maybe you should go there and experience it on their terms. But then when he goes there, the culture is fucked up. It's super fucked up. The entire system is incredibly messed up. So it's like, what are you saying here? Because you're saying both now. You're saying that people, you, you've, you've learned about this culture and you're using cultural primitivism and you shouldn't judge it that way. But when you go there, it's got the exact elements that cultural primitivism falls into, which is the belief that it's over-sexualized and this belief in that they're all cutthroats and gonna steal from people, etc. And it has all those elements. So I was, I was baffled in the sense of what it was actually trying to convey. And so then, it, I was also fine in a sense of saying, okay, so if you're critiquing the idea that it's saying that um, the treatment of women in this book is abhorrent, there are terrible things done to women, there are terrible situations that women find themselves in that they shouldn't have to. And I was like, okay, from what people have said, that's addressed in the later books, that this is the idea. Book one sets up that Babel is a corrupting force. It is going to corrupt, uh, it, it, it has already corrupted all of those there, and that is the idea of it. So uh, it treats women very poorly, it treats the poor poorly, and we see that through the relationship of Thomas, and we see that with his wife who has been lost in the Tower of Babel. Um, and also other characters we meet along the way. However, Thomas Senlin also met his wife when she was at school, and he was her teacher, and not, he, he, you can't even give it the out of being like, oh, well, you know, it's, um, like, maybe he was the lecturer, you know, like, maybe it's at a uni level. No, no, no. They literally specify that after three years of him knowing her, she is leaving the town to go get higher education. So in the UK, going to get higher education is 18. So under that assumption, three years beforehand, he was trying, he was teaching this girl at 15. He knew her as a child. And then the moment she turned 18, he's like, man, I want to rail that. Patient paedophile Thomas Sendlin. That is the only way to describe him, in my opinion. It made me feel very icky. And I didn't understand then the idea that, okay, so if the Tower of Babel was meant to be critiquing the idea of how the corruption is used to destroy and subjugate women, why aren't we addressing, why is it never addressed in this book at all that Thomas Sendlin dated a girl that he taught when she was a child and he was an adult? The implied power dynamic involved there is odd to say the least. So this is my issue. There's a lot of mixed messages in this book, a lot of confusion around what is the author actually trying to get me to take away from this book? Because right now, I don't know. It seems like the further we'll go in this series, the more that I will be distanced from the worries I've had in the first book. I enjoy, I actually enjoy all of the characters, the side characters, are fantastic in this book. I've loved every single one of them. I thought that the, uh, actually when we get into the tower, the the section in the parlor, for those that have read it, I absolutely adored the parlor. I thought it was the best part of the book. It was, I could not put the book down. I loved that section so much. 
And then I, I loved his relationship with other characters. I loved the journey that Thomas Semlin takes in this book. The, the kind of self-assured, mild-mannered man who then realises he has had terrible and completely wrong estimations of what he was getting into. And the journey that takes place there was fascinating. There is so much to love in this book. The writing, as I said, is almost unbeatable in the sense of how gorgeous and all-consuming the prose is. But throughout, I was hit with these, these very large speed bumps in what what is happening here? What is being said here? Why is this happening? Why is this not being addressed? Will this ever be addressed? I feel icky. I feel wrong in some parts. It, it, it felt like it was drawing inspiration. It, it was drawing inspiration from Jules Verne and that type of thing, but it felt like it was doing it in almost the wrong way, that rather than taking the elements from that that you can bring forward into a new book, Instead, it was like, well, these things are also like these negative things, the things that aren't critiqued in this book, but are instead just presented with a an open ended. Well, this is how it is. And it's like, what are you saying by that? What are you actually saying when you say this stuff? Um, I feel like I've I feel like I have said my piece. Uh, I actually wasn't planning on recording a review for this because I don't know how I feel about it, but I know that I'm going to be reading the rest of the series as part of this buddy read, so I want to get my developing thoughts as I go along. Um, be it I read the next one and it's even worse the, about certain things in IDNF, or it addresses some of these and I can come back and let you know that personally for me, if you had the same issues, then I would advise keep going. It's, it's what I... Um, I'm hoping that overall this will create a uh, something at the very least, because right now uh, I gave this a 3.75 because like I said, almost all of the elements I really loved from the prose to the characters, on and on and on. Um, I thought the set pieces were phenomenal. I thought the action was really good. I thought there was so much to love. It just had these key flaws for me that were large enough to cast a very large shadow over my enjoyment um, and so hopefully it will change please let me know whether you think that will change for me um, and if you did enjoy please do like please do subscribe uh, i'm sorry alan if you even watch this i'd advise maybe you should have left beforehand but as always have a nice rest of your day